Alejandro Velez is the editor-in-chief of Nuestra Aparente Rendición, uh, the webpage, and he has a BA in political science and a PhD in humanities. In his PhD research, he sought to make visible the pernicious effects of peace and human rights that originated in the global securitarian response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He came back to Mexico in 2012. We're getting some uh, traffic in the background, it sounds like. Sorry about that. Uh, he came back to Mexico in 2012, and he enrolled in the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitan uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Alejandro. You'll have to uh, help me with that one. Xochimilco. Xochimilco, thank you. Uh, Social Psychology Faculty for a two-year post postdoctoral fellowship where he did research on the catastrophe of enforced disappearances in Mexico. And along with uh, Lolita Bosch, he edited the book Tu y yo uh, coincidimos en la noche terrible, which roughly translates to You and I concur on the terrible night which collect life, collected life stories of journalists and media workers that have been murdered or disappeared in the last 15 years since 2000 in Mexico. And he likes to dwell on the triangle between academia, journalism, and human rights defense. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alejandro. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, thank you for the people who are here in the webinar, thank you to the guys at I, ICNC. It, it was great. It, it's a great opportunity to to give this webinar, and I would like to dedicate well my brief uh, work to the relatives of, of missing persons, of disappeared persons that that I know here in Mexico, in Colombia, in Bosnia. Um, it's really complicated to. Uh, to comprise all what I have to say in half an hour, but I hope uh, in the Q&A we can make more of uh, what I'm talking about. Um, and, and for this appearance, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, it started, it really started with Operation Act in Neville uh, by Field Marshal Wilhelm Cato that um, decided to deter local resistance, especially at the Netherlands, and, and implement uh, efficient intimidation, not only by capital money punishment, but by measures which the relatives of the criminal and the population do not know the, the whereabouts of the prisoners. This uh, technique was escalated and perf perfected by by the French army during uh, the Indochina War and the Algerian Independence War. There's a very good movie, uh, The Battle of Algiers, that shows this uh, technique. There's also the investigation by journalist Marie Monique Corvin uh, that shows and, and even interviews some French military that acted and uh, performed and for the disappearance in those places. Um, and finally, the U.S. national security doctrine, maybe it's the most well-known example of enforced disappearance. Um, it was practiced in, in Latin America since as early as 1954, but especially in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s as a systematic practice to annihilate uh, the internal enemy in Latin America, the communists, the guerrillas, the, the student organizations, the unions, the labor unions in most of Latin America from Mexico to Chile, Peru, uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay. Uh, obviously we could talk a, a lot more on the history of import disappearance, but um, what do we mean when we uh, talk about enforced disappearance? Uh, we talk about persons deprived of liberty, where their whereabouts are unknown. There is a denial by the perpetrators that the disappearance has, has occurred. And this is very, very uh, important. Uh, disappearance may be committed by state actors, but also by non-state actors like paramilitary groups that may act or not on behalf of the state or on their own accord. 
uh, here the the definition by the Committee to Protect All People from Enforced Disappearance in the UN, in, uh, from the UN is, is very clear on that. Another uh, introductory question would be who, who are the victims of enforced disappearance? Where uh, the main purpose, as, as I already noted in the first slide, is to silence uh, the position and to create uh, terror. In Latin America, in Asia, Africa, the, the UN Working Group on First Disappearance have been working in, a, in almost 80 countries and there, obviously there are not clear uh, data, there are not clear statistics on the, on the issue, but mostly uh, men are the one who have been disappeared because they uh, are usually the part of the opposition, maybe in, in the parties or in labor unions, but also and women and children have been targeted and have been disappeared in different contexts. The, the obvious victim here in uh, for disappearance is the one who's kidnapped and disappeared and, and maybe tortured or killed, but also uh, the victims of this terrible crime are the spouses, the parents, the children, and the extended families, even friends of those who have been disappeared. So uh, for this presentation, when we talk about the victims, we are also uh, talking about uh, the relatives. Uh, as I said before, uh, even if we only uh, recognize or think about and for disappearance related to the South Cone, to Latin America, to uh, Brazil or Argentina or Chile, this crime has been committed in almost in more than 80 countries, uh, including uh, European countries and including also the United States. Here uh, it will be interesting to treat this in, an, in another space, in another webinar, the, the use of extraordinary rendition as, um, as a, and for disappearance during the war on terror. And, and for disappearance have been committed for, in different uh, contexts from Nepal to Thailand to Indonesia to Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Guatemala, uh, in Spain. So, uh, I want to uh, focus here that it, it is it has been widely a widely used technique or method to create terror in, in several countries. Now we we will begin uh, to talk about um, how victims, how the relatives have started to organize and to start collective action. Um, first, I want to stress the importance of um, some, some places, for example, uh, police stations, military bases, hospitals, morgues, attorney offices. When a relative, a friend disappears, this may be the most common places where you will start to look at for the whereabouts of your beloved one. Mm -hmm. And it depends if, he, for example, in, in, in democratic context, uh, you, should, you, you go to the attorney office and place a complaint, or if you are in, in, the, middle of a, uh, in the middle of a war or an authoritarian regime, you should, maybe police stations, military bases should be the obvious places. And these places are important because if the enforced disappearance are systematic, are committed in a systematic way, most of the relatives, the victims, will find each other there because um, this has happened in Argentina, this has happened in Colombia, in Mexico. Uh, mothers, especially mothers of disappeared persons, uh, usually meet and recognize each other in these type of places. It, depending on the context, 
uh, some some of the some survivors some victims will ask the help of local human rights organizations and they will they will they will also meet there with other people suffering the same the same crime this is the the beginning of of collective action it it it, it I, I just try like to make it really simple it it, it, it doesn't necessarily happen that way but uh, in many countries has happened in in this way so i i i i, I wanted to to stress that uh, one of the first uh, problems, the, face, the, the first challenges that the victims, the relatives of missing persons face, is to verbalize the disappearance. Um, uh, there's a, a scholar, uh, an Argentinian scholar, that uh, tells that um, the experience of the disappearance is unspeakable. It's unutterable, and there is a huge problem to trying to talk about it to other people, even family, even friends. Uh, the norm of the crime is 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 really uh, unbearable. So the first challenge they face is to to speak about it. Once the relatives feel confident to speak about it, they uh, they start to they. St start looking for patterns, for similarities among other cases, There's, they're starting to build a testimony. The, the, the building of a testimony is really, really important in, in the cases of enforced disappearance, and it's the first step uh, in telling other people outside their, their own uh, personal circle what happens, and it's the first step towards organizing because uh, they will be, they will start collecting testimonies and uh, and use them as a as a way to show the state what has happened. Here, I wanted uh, to. I really think it's a personal opinion. I don't know. Maybe we can uh, work it out in the Q and A. I, I think it's a myth that victims identify themselves. Uh, due to pain. Um, I have been working along with other friends, for example, Jimena Antillon in Mexico, uh, with relatives of missing people, and, and we think that that people, that victims recognize, recognize that collective action will make them stronger as a group, and in order to face uh, the state agents that are usually the ones either who committed the crime or the ones uh, that should investigate it. So, I don't know if it, it I, I really think they, they, they think collective action, it's, it's, a, it's a weight, it's a way to make them, their struggle a, bit, a little bit stronger. Um, it is really important to take out the testimony to to the public spaces. Public spaces are, are the discussion on public spaces is is it's really interesting. Here I I quote Chantal Mouffe. Uh, he she has a, a really good uh, papers on on public spaces. She calls them agonistic. In 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 a nutshell, is that spaces are battlegrounds with different hegemonic projects clash without any possibility of reconciliation and relatives of, of disappeared persons have to go to public spaces uh, in order to make crimes visible to, to everyone. It's in, in wartime or under or authoritarian regimes these uh, public spaces are not as safe uh, and in democratic uh, regimes they have to to quarrel with other demands with other people. Uh, in Mexico, it has been clear, for example, when the mothers of uh, disappeared persons uh, march on May the 10th, it's the Mother's Day, or on the day of uh, International Day of the Missing Persons, they usually uh, fight in the same streets where uh, 
people who want to walk or want to uh, drive their car. So it's it's a constant struggle in the public space, or that that's not easy. It's it's not easy to to reconcile. Uh, here I have like a little a little example uh, of what I'm talking about uh, in on public spaces. This is the, the first ronda of the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo. Here, um, the, the first march was uh, by 14 women. They were mothers of missing persons. And during the Argentinian dictatorship, there was a, a, a law that uh, prohibited more than, I, I don't remember very well, it was like 10 people to to, to be in the streets to meeting at the same time, so they decided to walk, to walk around this uh, monument, because in that way the police could not arrest them. They started, as, a, as the slide says, they, the first uh, 14 women started, and then in the next year there were hundreds. They, they were usually called Las Locas, because they were always walking around this obelisk. So this is a, a very good example of how uh, victims have entered the public space in a, well, in a creative way. There, there's also, for example, the example of the caravan, the Central American mothers looking for their children caravans in Mexico. They also go to the squares, they place the photographs in the, in the floor of their the photographs of their missing children, and they go there and ask the people to look at the photographs. This, that's another interesting uh, way to get into the public space. There are also sit-in protests. Um, sit-ins are, are really a simple way to denounce crimes committed and especially generate empathy and solidarity among, among people. Uh, the sit-ins usually take place in front of churches, government office, or as uh, the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo in important squares. Uh, also, uh, these sit-ins start with very few people, but they usually, uh, if it depends if, if they are uh, used by women or children. It, it can prevent immediate repression. In the case of uh, huge sit-ins, uh, this repression could be uh, exercised by the government. It depends on, it, it really depends on the composition of the sit-in. Um, there, there's this example in, in Kashmir, there's an association of parents of disappeared persons. They have been sitting uh, each tenth, tenth of uh, every month. They they sit in in a in a public square, and they uh, ask the Indian government to look for the for their missing ones. And these sit-ins have been really successful. They have even uh, forced the British government to talk to the Indian government on on the missing persons issue. Uh, there's another uh, method that that's really high cost, and this is uh, hunger strikes. Hunger strikes are uh, have been uh, used to raise awareness on enforced disappearance cases, and obviously it, it, we have we have seen that it is uh, it's kind of the Achilles. Uh, point of the government, they they don't want to for international media to go to and talk to the people that are on hunger strike and evidence that they're not doing anything on on the issue. But as as I mentioned here in the in the slide, it's a very high high cost way to attract attention. Uh, it's a desperate way also, but uh, sometimes uh, desperation is so high that it seems like the, the only way to, to attract attention and to force the government into, into some actions. Uh, there's a very uh, famous hunger strike here in Mexico City. 
uh, during the 70s. It, it was a hunger strike of the Doñas of Eureka. These are the mothers of the people that were disappeared during the dirty war in Mexico between 60, 1968 and 1982. And the, the first major act of this Eureka Committee was a hunger strike in front of the Mexico City Cathedral. And obviously it was not only the hunger strike, but also the, the lobbying and the constant demonstrations. But they, they achieved the liberation of uh, 1,500 political prisoners and the suspension of 2,000 arrest orders. So even though they haven't found their, their beloved ones, they prevented other political disappearances. Um, the use of symbols has been really important during uh, uh, this struggle. Uh, as you should probably know, uh, for disappearance leaves a huge vacuum in the lives of relatives, friends of the victims. It's, uh, it, it, it creates a, a, a dark space between waiting and mourning because uh, you don't know where uh, your relative is, so you cannot mourn it, mourn, mourn him or her. So there's no body. So relatives of the missing persons have used different symbols to try to give meaning to their struggle. Uh, the Doñas of uh, Eureka Committee, they use black clothing. They, uh, they also uh, create some jewelry, some pins with the photos of their beloved ones. So whenever the government asks them for a meeting, they, they always have them near their heart. Uh, the mothers of Plaza de Mayo use the diapers of their, of their sons. Uh, some uh, activists in Juarez and some relatives in Juarez have used shoes, red shoes, to, for the for the women. Um, I, I I really like the example, um, the use of silhouettes in Argentina in 1983, as the as a part of uh, Marcha de la Resistencia, the March of Resistance. They uh, this this march was. Uh, it was a big march against the dictatorship, and some uh, uh, collective of artists and group of artists started to cut life-size silhouettes to draw attention on the missing, on the on the, on the vacuum of the absence. Um, this, uh, there are amazing photographs of that march uh, of, of people carrying these uh, black silhouettes with with the names, and this symbol has been very very effective and has been copied in in other demonstrations in Colombia and Mexico and. They have become icons of the of resistance. Um, maybe um, whenever we talk about uh, missing persons, the first image we we have in our head is the 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 mother uh, holding a photograph of their missing uh, child or their missing uh, husband. It, it is uh, it has been a, a really uh, common image from Bosnia to Colombia to Mexico to Nepal, um, and this photograph, this uh, visual media has been used really to, to raise awareness on the crime. The, the, uh, the photographs are, are very important because uh, the, the photograph show the society that these persons really lived, really existence, and they, they should they should be here. So. I, I, here in the slide, I, I quote Roland Barthes. Uh, he states that the referent captured by the camera necessarily has to have been there, as without him there would be no image. There are very, very good artists, uh, for example, Gustavo Germano, that have used photographs to, to show the absence left by the missing persons. Uh, but here I wanted like to talk about the example of uh, the Colombian Association of Relatives of Detainees and Disappeared as FADES. Uh, they, they put the photographs in these placards and whenever there's a big demonstration or uh, the International Day of, the missing, uh, of Missing Persons, they, they put them in the public square in Plaza Bolivar or in other, in other places, as if they the missing were present there. So um, 
here they, they call this the gallery of memory because uh, they want the missing to stay present uh, during these important dates. Another very interesting uh, method is the resignification of graves and disappearance sites. Uh, there is a huge landscape of the disappearance. We have already talked about jails, police stations, military camps. These places where enforced disappearances occur. There, there are also uh, the places where the bodies are dumped, the mass graves, and relatives of missing people, or missing persons have uh, have tried to resignify some of these places. Uh, I have two two examples. Here is the transformation of uh, the ESMA, the Escuela de Mecánica de, of Argentina. It was, it was a prison and it was, after the dictatorship, it was transformed into a museum, a human rights center. And it was, I, I found it like the, the perfect uh, example of how to resignify a place uh, where torture, uh, uh, extrajudicial killing and disappearance uh, occurred into a place of memory. There's also the case of uh, a, it's a, a property in Tijuana called uh, Maclovio Rojas. This uh, place, in this place, there were uh, human bodies were dissolved in acid in uh, in baking soda and relatives found about 50,000 50, liters of human remains. So this, this, this was a horrible sighting and they decided uh, to begin to uh, plant trees to create, a, uh, to transform this place into a memory site, into a, a, a place where, to resignify all the place. Um, just uh, last few slides. Uh, the, the the impact of the of resilience and defiance to enforce disappearance has been huge. Uh, obviously, uh, we have a very few time, but the struggle of organizations, solidarity groups have uh, created helped to create the universalization of the crime in in the UN. Uh, the, the creation of the working group and the International Commission of Missing Persons ha has been thanks to the, the struggle of, of all the relatives that have faced this crime all around the world. The creation of fact-finding teams, uh, the universalization of forensic protocols and fast search protocols is also a great victory of, of this movement. Systematization of data, creation of archives, uh, to create an alternative memory from the one that has been created uh, by the state. Uh, obviously, international awareness right now, uh, as you remember, 43 uh, students from Ayotzinapa were forcibly disappeared uh, seven, almost seven months ago, and, and the world knew about it, so uh, there was international awareness on the issue. There are the creation of uh, mutual aid collective solidarity associations uh, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Peru, in Guatemala, it's a, it's, uh, it's a very good news for the relatives to form this kind of, of groups and associations to face the state. And also the creation of independent forensic teams and foundations that, that should be the, the theme of another webinar, the Argentinian forensic team, the Peruvian forensic team, the Mexican forensic team, the ICMP in Bosnia, uh, anyway. And finally, uh, obviously there are for the step needed, and there are a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, sharing the experiences among uh, different groups and associations around the world, because uh, even though the the context of the disappearance are different, the the struggle I think they should learn. It, it is important for relatives to to learn from other experiences. Uh, the acknowledging acknowledging that also for disappearance are committed under democratic regimes. And this is the case of Mexico for a lot of uh, time. Mexico was only tequila, Acapulco, and Cancun until uh, Ayotzinapa happened. But when Ayotzinapa happened, there were 
almost more more than 27,000 missing persons in Mexico. So uh, even in the democratic regime, so-called democratic regime, this this happened. Um, we also have to include uh, young people in the mobilizations, in the demonstrations, and that's a, a huge challenge. Um, helping relatives to speak out um, and also to transcend testimony, you know, because it is it is extremely painful to to stay in the testimony. They 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 are learning other ways to to talk about disappearance and to raise awareness on the issue, and being more strategic and find state witnesses and learn how to exploit them and and face uh, state and the agents that have performed the disappearances. Um, well, I think it's it's all. I, I will be more than happy to answer some, some questions. Thank you very much again for the attention and for the ICNC for the opportunity.